all for coming, and thank you for the Federal Reserve Bank for having us here today. Um, I'm Jennifer Leonard. I am the Vice President and Director of, I don't even know anymore, National Learning and Education. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the Center for Community Progress. It's an organization that's actually based in Flint, Michigan, but I'm in our DC office. We've got offices in Detroit, some staff in Atlanta, and an office in New Orleans as well. And this is the most awkward thing because I'm so short. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this session and prepping for it, it occurred to me how long we've actually been looking and thinking and talking about these issues of both vacancy and foreclosures. And certainly in Ohio, the vacancy and foreclosures have been going on longer than many other states. But it just has been such a long time. But it also occurs to me that it sort of seems every year there's something new. There's something new that people are trying. There's new language, like the zombie properties, um, which I kind of love because I love Walking Dead. But it's, it's a very weird sort of term. But it is something new that people are always framing things around and new things that people are trying to uh, deal with it. So this session today, let's see, <coughs> we have four great speakers. And in order of the way they're going to speak, we've got Frank Ford from Thriving Communities Institute. And their bios are in the packet, so I won't read them. Gus Frangos from the Cuyahoga County Land Reutilization Corporation. For those of you online uh, watching this who are not familiar with Land Reutil Reutilization Corporation, it's the land bank. We've got uh, Spencer Cowan from Woodstock Institute out of Chicago and Craig Nickerson from the National Community Stabilization Trust. I'm going to kick it off to them. And just so you know, they're each going to do about 8 to 10 or 11 minutes of intro. We're going to have a little bit of conversation and then about 15, 20 minutes of questions for you guys. And I only say that so you guys aren't all standing in the back while we're talking a little bit. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, before I start, there was something just from the last session. Peter Skillen fielded a question about investors uh, buying REO property, and he said that he referred everybody to the Dan Immergluck study in Atlanta. Uh, that was part of uh, a Harvard study done in four cities. Cleveland was one of them. So if you read the Atlanta study, you're really reading the wrong study. It's a good study, but you need to read the study I did for Cleveland, which Mike Schramm and others. And perhaps uh, Tom or the Fed can help me get that out, a link to every, everybody. Is there? Thank you. OK. So um, local responses to charge-offs and walkaways. Starting with the norm of what we would expect, foreclosure filed, foreclosure judgment, bank requests sheriff sale, bank bids at sheriff sale, bank takes title and then becomes responsible. Taxes, condition of the property code violations. Charge off walk away on the right. Foreclosure filed, foreclosure judgment. Bank doesn't request sheriff sale would be one possibility. They discovered that the property at that point did a field inspection. Wait, this property is empty now. It's deteriorated. We don't want it. Uh, or they may request the sheriff sale, but then before the sheriff sale they discover this and they don't bid. They move for dismissal. Taxpayers absorb the cost of the un unpaid taxes and the code violations, which could include the cost of demolition. Here's the global picture of that in Cuyahoga County. Uh, there are currently, this is data that I just looked at yesterday with Mike Schramm's help, 24,000 vacant homes, over $50 million in uncollected taxes on those vacant homes. Um, in the city of Cleveland, it's actually 16,000 vacant homes, of which 8,300 have been determined by the city to be demolition candidates. That's an $83 million problem, which we don't have the money. Of the 8,300, 1,800 of them, uh, about one out of four, are a stalled foreclosure in that there is uh, dismissed, vacated, or no sale after judgment. The, the limitation of this, this is a year-old data. There's been an issue with the Common Pleas Court data. Uh, I know that there's uh, somebody here from the Common Pleas Court uh, we might suggest that uh, it would be really great to get this data back to where we can get it on a, on a current basis. Um, I want to look at a specific property to give you a, a feel for this. Now, this is a property I was directly involved in with a community organization. Uh, 2004, $92,000 mortgage from Long Beach, certainly one of the more notorious subprime lenders. Uh, Long Beach was bought by Washington Mutual. WAMU assigns the loan to Deutsche Bank who retained uh, servicing, apparently, because then Chase, who bought Washington Mutual, becomes the servicer in this. 
In 08, the loan is modified from a 92,000 to 111,000, and the term is extended to 40 years. I wouldn't say that's a very thoughtful modification, uh, not very sustainable. Um, and within a year, less than a year, Deutsch files foreclosure. July of 09, they get a judgment. Three months later, there's a sheriff's sale. They don't bid. Presumably sometime between when they filed and the sheriff's sale, they discovered, wait, this is a vacant house. It's got little value. We don't want it. We're not going to bid on it. In October, a few days later, actually, there's a motion by Deutsch or Chase, actually, because they're servicing this, to vacate the judgment. The judge denies the motion. Uh, so it, it just sits in limbo. It's not going to sheriff sale. Um, now, in the meantime, the property is condemned in, uh, in 2011. In February of 12, a CDC, uh, this is in the Collinwood neighborhood, asked Chase to assign the lien to them. They want the property. They feel they can renovate it. Chase says, no, we're only willing to release the lien. So now we've talked a lot about the settlement that required you. I heard it in the previous discussion. The bank either should complete the foreclosure or release the lien. This is a case where the release of the lien did absolutely nothing. Uh, the house ends up being demolished. The city pays that expense. Uh, there's delinquent tax as of today, $10,295. Uh, two categories of local response. Now, the first one is really not the walk away strictly. It's assuming the bank did get title. There are three things that I wanted to talk about. One is Cleveland has a new ordinance uh, which deals with joint, provides for joint and several liability, meaning, let me just go right to the hypothetical. Deutsche Bank takes title at sheriff sale. Do you see, Deutsche is my favorite. I'm, I'm sorry. But the, uh, Deutsche Bank takes title at sheriff sale. Two months later, the city condemns the house during Deutsche's ownership. Three months after that, Deutsch sells the property to an investor in Utah, Provo, Utah, by the way. Uh, city demolishes the house. The city can now go after Deutsch or the investor. They can reach back in time to the previous owner, provided they documented the condition during the ownership. Uh, and that's where the joint and several liability comes in. A second is civil suits for public nuisance. Uh, this might have even been referenced in the materials that this would be talked about. Um, this is, Ohio has a statute for this. The bank needs to be the owner, though. So it's another case where it's not quite dealing with the walk away yet. Um, the bank can be ordered by the court to repair or demolish the property. And unlike criminal code violation cases, can even proceed if the bank or owner doesn't show up. And contempt of court fines can be issued for failure to comply with the court order. The fines can be converted to judgment. Now, in Cleveland and Cincinnati, there were lawsuits against Deutsche and Wells Fargo. I was involved in the Cleveland cases. We did dismiss the Wells Fargo cases for the very reason that when Tyler Smith said, he said some magic words. I, I wrote them down. He said, I've got to find it here. Uh, uh, sorry, Tyler, you could probably, we will demo and donate. In fact, Kamla said, did you all get that? Uh, because that's, that's really critical. Based on that, we, we started to think, there's no, we don't need to sue them. If they're willing to do that, and I think that's a, that's a huge turnaround. Vacant property registration ordinance. Now, here's the plain vanilla registration ordinance. The owner must register, provide contact information for code compliance, pay a registration fees. The first version that anybody knows of, I think, was in Wil Wilmington, Delaware, way back about 12 years ago, had a dual purpose, provide contact information for code compliance, but also with an escalating fee structure, the longer it was held, there was really a penalty to hold onto the property. It was discouraging and abandonment. The lending industry is in favor of VPRs, as people know them, that provide the contact information, but not anything with any financial penalties. So let's go to the good stuff. This is what happens when there's going to be a walk away. They don't take it to sheriff's sale. What can communities do? Now, the first thing is it's a little known. I'm going to go back to my Harlan case. This was my case study. In that case, the plaintiff moved to vacate the judgment, stating it no longer wishes to proceed with the foreclosure. The judge, desiring not to proceed with a foreclosure that has already been disposed of, is not an appropriate basis to vacate judgment. The plaintiff, but the account has been charged off. Judge, charging off a loan is not an appropriate basis for vacating of a judgment. Motion denied. The problem is that doesn't go far enough, because as you recall from the example, Chase basically said, OK, we leave it it's sitting there in the court records. It's never been resolved, but we're not doing anything with the property. Here's the next step, and there's only one judge that I know of that's doing this, and she has a standing order, Judge Nancy Margaret Russo. In her, you can go online and see her standing orders of the court. 
and it says the bank is ordered to proceed the sheriff's sale. And if they don't, there can be a show cause hearing to find why shouldn't they be found in contempt. That's pretty powerful. Uh, we have over, what is it, 30, 33 judges in common police court? We have one doing this. I'd like to see all 30, 33 of them do this. Uh, criminal prosecution. Now, here's something that's also not that well known. Most code enforcement ordinances have a provision that says not only is the owner responsible, but any party in possession or control. So what if the bank changes the locks? What if they board up the house? Other indications? So there's a possibility there. Only Youngstown, I believe, might be the only city that's actually using this uh, there may be others, and please correct me if anybody knows of anybody who is using it. I see uh, Stephanie from Cincinnati is nodding her head. And I did, I think I asked Ron O'Leary, and he said that the city of Cleveland might have done this on what, it's not our standard practice, but I think this should be looked at very closely. Now, finally, we get to the vacant property registration ordinances that are a step beyond the plain vanilla version. And here's the Cincinnati, and my take on the Cincinnati and Stephanie, please feel free to correct me uh, if I get this wrong. Two-stage process. Foreclosure and vacancy triggers registration by the bank. That's a standard feature of VPROs. Provide contact information and pay a fee. But they add, and you must secure and maintain the home, the exterior of the home. That's a step above most plain vanilla vacant property registration. But then they have a second step. Once the bank requests sheriff's sale, then there's a full inspection. The bank is ordered to repair. Whatever that inspection finds, if they don't, the city can do it and impose a high priority lien for that. Now, the problem with that is, and this is, and again, I'll invite Stephanie to challenge me on this, but the problem I see is that if they request the sheriff's sale, but then they don't go to the sheriff's sale. They just, what if they don't request the sheriff's sale? We still have the walkaway problem, which takes us to the last one. This is the vacant property registration ordinance with the bond that has become very controversial. Uh, it actually started in Massachusetts and Springfield and Worcester, Mass., and uh, Youngstown is doing it, Canton and Warren, and I'd say Youngstown is probably the, the leading example because they've had the most success with it. But notice here's what happens. For, foreclosure and vacancy triggers registration as before, contact info, pay the fee, but $10,000 bond. Now this is the bank is not the owner yet. They've just filed the foreclosure and the property's gone vacant. But the municipality of Youngstown is saying, you want to come into our jurisdiction and you want to do this, we want you to protect us against the risk that you're going to let this thing go vacant. If you want to initiate the foreclosure and empty out the home, do it by making sure we're held harmless with a $10,000 bond in case we have to demolish it. Uh, foreclosure bonds, the history of them in Ohio, Youngstown enacted in January of 13, began enforcement of April 13. They've collected 112 bonds between April and December, and they're now up to 142 as of a few weeks ago when I last talked to them, 1.1 million on account. Staffing required, just one part-time staff that they say is being handled by the $200 administrative fee. And they said to me they feel they have three elements of success, or several, community engagement process. Uh, they spent several months doing that, and they did a lender education process for three months. And they view the bond as not the only thing they do, but as part of the comprehensive code enforcement. And they also took time to develop some thoughtful uh, forms and procedures. I have a postscript, I'm pretty much done, but on this moral hazard question, I just wanted to weigh in on this. So anatomy of a responsible homeowner, pays the mortgage, pays property tax, performs maintenance. How many? What do I have left? Oh, you, two. Yeah, two minutes, okay. What if we have the charge off, they're not paying the mortgage? But hypothetically, if they were still paying the property tax and they were maintaining the home, in a distressed market, and I bolded that because I think that's the narrow, I'm looking at the stress markets like Cleveland. The loan collateral of the home could be damaged and valueless within days of becoming vacant. Not 120 days, days. In fact, hours. Um, if a lender decides to charge off the loan, what course of action furthers market stabilization? Allow the otherwise responsible owner to remain in the home without a mortgage or vacate the home? I think, at least for my hypothetical, most people would want to see the home vacated. In Cleveland, we'd prefer to see the home Oh, occupied, excuse me. Uh, yes, good. Yeah, there are people sort of, oh, what do you mean by that? Okay. Uh, my last slide, and this is just a resource. Case Western Reserve has done um, a nice study on this well before anybody else. It goes back several years, stalling the foreclosure process. And uh, it might, this will be up online, and you can get the link to this as well. Thank you.
Good morning, and thank you for the invitation to speak today and present. Uh, my name is Gus Frangles from the Cuyahoga Land Bank. Um, Frank has done, a, done an excellent job of um, showing that cat and mouse uh, game that goes on between lenders and, um, and the courts um, in terms of you know, bringing a case to foreclosure, getting a judgment, seeking to vacate it, saying no, forcing it to go to sale. But in the end, in the end, um, you can't make a bank bid its lien. So even if a judge says in the, in the, uh, under the threat of contempt, you better take this to sale, order of sale, second order, pluries, on and on and on. In the end, it's very difficult uh, to deal with this thing. And so um, it's, uh, it's fraught with a lot of policy considerations that, that all of us here need to try to, to deal with um, to get some sensible and legal and constitutional um, uh, response to this thing because it still remains somewhat out of control. Um, but so um, Frank left off with the idea of a moral hazard, the moral hazard question, and I have a little bit of a different take on it. And um, so without... Uh, Excuse me, how do I, uh, do I just hit up? To the right. Oh, to the right, like, oh, good. Sorry. Um, so my uh, presentation is uh, not so much focused on all of the law and the cat and mouse game and the problem, which is, you know, very apparent and well articulated um, by Frank. Um, he's probably the best in the world that, that does that. Um, one, re uh, my uh, presentation has to do is, okay, so here we are, here we are. Um, I think that it's a, a safe statement for all of the participants here to say that we don't have enough REO financial institution cooperation when it comes to zombie loans, donations, um, filing foreclosures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that, that, in my opinion, is, is a given. That's the world we are operating in. However, um, the, my presentation has to do is why a properly funded uh, land bank can promote cooperation with REOs, with financial institutions, with respect to low value assets. Um, some reasons why financial institutions will donate, and I'm, again, I'm probably preaching to the choir here to be sure, but um, I can't read that far on that panel over there, so let me just uh, move here a bit. Um, it's to obviously, um, uh, why would they donate? Get rid of uncollectible assets from their portfolio to avoid holding expenses, the kind of um, hazards that Frank articulated um, with code enforcement, taxes, finding themselves in the housing court and having, you know, incredible penalties if they find themselves in front of our local judge, Ray Pianca here. Um, and, and in many instances we have found uh, they do wish to cooperate sometimes, um, whether it's a CRA motivation or, or a, B, and C motivation resulting in the D, in the D cooperation. Um, these are the reasons why a bank will donate. Um, why will, this, these are properties that they already have, obviously. Um, why will financial, uh, why financial institutions walk away? Kind of the same reasons, to avoid uncollectible assets, to avoid foreclosure expense. Why even file a case if you're in the bank's mind, their business model? Why even file a foreclosure and spend three, five, eight, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 on a foreclosure for an asset that's ready to fall down, and the last thing they want to do is bring it into their inventory is REO. It makes more business sense, not sense from our standpoint, but business sense not to even pursue the thing, and hence the classic zombie loan. Um, the holding expense, avoid uh, code enforcement, but in the event that a bank wants to try to be responsive, um, part of it has to do with a lack of exit strategy and the moral hazard in the event they wanted to um, participate in an exit strategy. Um, so what are the impediments to donating to well-intended repositories um, or pursuing the foreclosure? And sometimes it just has to deal with the bureaucracy. Sometimes organizations, they have difficulties um, dealing with cities, not because cities are incapable or they are not good, but they're just inherent with due process and public, uh, all kinds of public impediments. The bureaucracy that makes it very difficult. So if you're Fannie Mae or if you're a lender or you're whatever and you have to sit and go through 10 hoops instead of three hoops, you know, it's an impediment. Um, obviously, the length of time and costs associated with bringing the process forward um, when there is no exit strategy. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it at the end in terms of the time uh, and cost and the moral hazard. And that's uh, um, what I wanted to focus in a little bit on here today. Um, 
the moral hazard from a little bit different perspective um, uh, of Frank, but, but a continuation of what um, Frank said. Um, sometimes, and we have found this with Fannie Mae and with HUD, they want to deal with our land bank. They want to deal with other land banks and communities. However, um, there's either a lack of experience or there's a management uh, uh, inability, or maybe there's just all of that but no capacity. Um, and that leads to number B there, the lack of funding despite lack of bureaucracy and despite capability and expertise and technical experience. Um, you have to have them both. Um, you have all this knowledge and experience and capability, but no money, um, you, you really can't do a whole lot. So the moral hazard of foreclosing on and donating REO properties, the moral hazard, has to do with the repository of being incapable of a quality triage and disposition of the properties. I mean, this is, it's obviously serious business. You're bringing in properties that have all kinds of liability exposure. There's, there's crime, there's vandalism, there's you name it. It's serious business bringing in tons and tons of property. Um, and if you can bring them in and you can transact, um, some organizations don't have the ability to field service those things. Um, some hold, sometimes, uh, occasionally, a, a, a well-meaning repository will bring properties in uh, and they find themselves in a position that they just can't manage that liability, so they're constrained to offload that property, sometimes uh, by cutting corners or in an unwholesome way, um, which is bad management and oftentimes leads to, to crimes, fire, and vandalism. So the, the moral hazard to a lending or a financial institution is we've got to be careful to who we engage for this purpose on a large scale basis because the backlash to the lending institution is accusations of unwholesome offloading and destabilization. Um, so, and again, I would emphasize that um, we don't have enough banks and financial institutions cooperating, but getting into their head sometimes uh, moves the process forward and sometimes you can promote some cooperation. On the other hand, uh, properly funded land banks, they can hire the professionals, uh, attorneys, accountants, etc. Um, they can afford to hold that property pending an evaluation. Should it go to demolition? Should it go to rehab? Um, can they develop systems to properly evaluate and categorize the properties? And can they engage the end users um, that are doing a lot of the boots on the ground type of stuff that we, that we so much rely on? And it allows the um, banks to engage in donation strategies that would at least appear more community sensitive, um, albeit not as much as we'd like. So I don't want to give anybody the impression here that um, I was hired by the banks to talk about all their needs. Um, but it is important to get into your, for lack of a better word, your, your adversaries or your counterparts head to try to make progress. Um, so um, I've said all that, and that's an assumption, it's a theory, and what has been the land bank's experience? Um, since we started, and, and we have been very fortunate here, I will admit, um, that we have had a, a funding stream, a reliable funding stream, that we don't have to go running back to a legislature every year or every six months to try to get our funding, and, and, and we don't compete with streets and lights and potholes and all those sorts of things. Um, that allows us um, to do what we do, and to the Ohio legislature's credit, to our county's credit, they felt that that was essential if we were going to make any kind of meaningful um, impact. So that kind of um, that kind of table being set has resulted in our pooling arrangements with Fannie Mae. Fannie Mae, uh, we've had kind of an up and down sometimes with Fannie in terms of um, the value of assets that they wish to contribute to us. But when they contribute, and it's a demolition of property, um, they pay us $3,500. Um, HUD continues to give us properties valued at $25,000 and under. Um, financial institutions, we've had good relationships with Wells Fargo and Bank of America and several others. Um, we brought in hundreds of properties from those institutions. And again, think about it, Fannie and HUD and Wells Fargo and Bank of America, they're not going to do that if they're just offloading the properties to some, to some enterprise that has no capacity um, to do anything with them. It's just bad from their standpoint, bad from the community standpoint, and bad from the organization, whether it's a city or another nonprofit who doesn't have those um, capabilities. Um, and I'm hoping that Wells Fargo will come back and re-up our, our agreement. Um, but in the meantime, we are um, still working together, um, and I hope it will be more. Um, and of course, uh, 
I list just for reference, um, the other um, source of our income is tax uh, properties is tax foreclosure and the courts. Um, the result of this is that uh, so far from HUD since 2009 when we started, we brought in uh, 1,161 uh, properties. Fannie, you see what that is. And the financial institutions, again, this is where um, it's not adequate. It's not enough for the, for the problem that, that we face in our communities. So the challenge to these banks and financial institutions is take this number, 270, and let's, uh, at least in Cuyahoga County, and make that 1,000 167 or 2,000 or whatever. But the point is, is that um, it's progress. Um, with respect to those properties that we got from HUD, Fannie, financial institutions, from HUD, 407 um, have been um, demolished, uh, 505 from Fannie and financial institutions, 135, which means many of the others have been rehabbed. Um, roughly, uh, roughly 750 dentists, close to 800. Where are you, Dennis? roughly 800, through this process, we have facilitated rehabs. So that's a good thing as well. The caveat, uh, okay, I've been making the caveat throughout my speech here. Um, walkaways, my last comment is uh, the walkaways and the fast track. And I have a number of questions there because banks, financial institutions have always said, well, we would just do more if we had fast track. If this could go quicker, we would be able to save the quality of the collateral and plus it would just go faster and we really want that. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we have proposed um, fast track legislation, which we hope to get introduced here in the next little bit. Um, but it will beg the question, if that gets, gets introduced and it's made available for distressed assets, then the challenge will be again, financial institutions take advantage of it because a good, true fast track bill, and I'm not just talking about the back end, there's fast track bills all over the country that they either just deal with the back end or they deal with the sheriff sale. It's front end to back end, service of process, uh, evidentiary presumptions, um, things of that sort. Things that are important to banks uh, related to that are they want to be able to do service of process. They want to do their auctions. They want to do certain things, and it's all relatively appropriate, um, but it may have unintended consequences. You lose, perhaps, the ability to track these things for all the work that we're doing. That's an issue. It's just it's appropriate for discussion. Um, and plus, there are some things that are just uh, more appropriate for a clerk's office to do or, or a sheriff, but those are ripe and fair for discussion. But um, so I think a fast track, a true fast track bill that has an exit strategy that builds into it the ability for negotiated exit strategies with land banks would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. If I didn't go over too much, it's close. I'm giving everyone a tiny little bit of a grace period. Thank you, and I get to be the first one to say good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about the research we've done at Woodstock Institute, um, in part because of what was said in the first panel, and then talk about what Cook County and the City of Chicago have done to address the problem of unresolved foreclosures. The first is the purpose of our research was to get a handle on the dimension of the problem how big a problem were unresolved foreclosures. And this differs in some respects from the methodology that the earlier presenters used. And then talk about the public policy responses. Our definition of zombie properties was properties that had been in the foreclosure process without any resolution for over three years. It means they're not necessarily vacant. They can be, still be occupied. And we used three years because the average time to foreclose in Cook County was 815 days in 2013. That's up, up from 697 the year before. What we did is we developed a way to estimate how many properties were stuck in the foreclosure process. And that's where we, um, where the problem, and to find out where the problem is most acute to inform policymakers. So we looked at filings between 2008 and 2010, give them enough time to have worked through the normal course of the system, to see first which properties had been sold at auction. 
So that includes REO. Uh, we do use proprietary data that, unfortunately, I have to admit this doesn't come, didn't come from Realty Track. Uh, and then we took a random sample of the properties that were not foreclosed, stratified by the income of the census tract, and it was based on the weighted income. And we then looked to see what happened. And we based our records on the circuit court chancery division, which handles foreclosures, and the recorder of deeds. And we had four categories of outcome. The most important for this presentation is those that were unresolved and still pending. That is, the case is still on file, no dismissal, no sale, and there's no transfer on the recorder of deeds records. So to estimate the percentage of filings, which is not vacancies, but filings that become stuck in the process, it's basically the probability that a property doesn't get sold at auction, in other words, doesn't complete the foreclosure process, times the potential from the sample that the pr property doesn't have another disposition, deed in lieu, sale to a, short sale to a third party, uh, modification, or something like that. And what we found was, and it was a little bit of a surprise to me, that the probability of a property going into foreclosure and not coming out for more than three years was roughly the same across all of the income quintiles. So it was about 8.5%. It was a little higher in the lower income quintiles, but not hugely different. So what this ends up with, however, is that there are a lot more zombie properties in the lower income quintile census tracts because there were so many more filings. And just under 60% were in the bottom two quintiles, and slightly over 20% were in the top two. In terms of numbers, that comes out to 11,700 zombie properties in Cook County, 5,800 of which are in the city of Chicago. We estimate that this is, as somebody said earlier, a cumulative problem. So this is for foreclosures filed 2008 to 10. They didn't, people didn't stop filing foreclosure in 2011. If we add in filings since then, that will add another 7,200 zombie properties stuck in foreclosure in Cook County and another 3,200 within the city of Chicago. And we mapped them to show the distribution because, and the one on the right, I think it is, shows where the zombie properties are. Those are the Chicago community areas, which are neighborhoods that the city defines. And you can see that the pro problem is concentrated in the south and west, which happen to be low-income, high-minority census tracts generally. You can see that the lower incomes concentrate there. And it's very similar maps of other indicators of distress. So these properties are in neighborhoods that are already suffering. And I'm going to, so what, what the county and city have done, one is pass a vacant building ordinance which holds servicers accountable for maintaining and securing properties once the foreclosure process starts, before it's completed. Now, unfortunately, FHFA filed a suit against, I think it was the city, may have been the county, and was ruled to be exempt from the requirement. Lower levels of government cannot impose on a higher level. The city and county cannot impose on FHFA, which is federal. Um, they've also, many of the municipalities, and Chicago is the largest, but there are many other municipalities in Cook County have adopted vacant building registry requirements. Chicago has one. Uh, they've got significant variation among the municipalities in what data are collected. Pretty consistently they collect contact information, but only about half collect information on even whether the property is residential or commercial. And the level of detail goes down from there so that, and I think compliance is probably not a hundred percent. Both Cook County and the South Suburban Mayor's Caucus have created land banks. We have the Cook County Land Bank Authority and the South Suburban Land Bank Authority. Both are pretty much in the startup phase. 
So South Suburban, I think, may have started acquiring properties. The Cook County Land Bank, which is much larger, uh, area coverage and cover, would cover many more properties, has hired an executive director, and they are in the process of developing their acquisition, holding, and disposition strategies because they know that there are going to be more properties than they really can deal with. The land bank did receive, I believe, $20 million in startup funding from the National Mortgage Foreclosure Settlement. Our attorney general uh, controlled a pool of funds, and, and one of her awards was to the Cook County Land Bank. And Cook County originally was an experimental fast-track docket. Now, it's a little hard to trace how many properties actually go through fast track because you file in the regular chancery division docket and then when the servicer determines that the property is vacant, they file a motion to have it moved onto one of the special fast track dockets. So there's really not a nice, neat, easy way to look at this. The best estimate we could come up with, we looked at foreclosures, what percent of foreclosures in Cook County were completed within one year? looking at time from filing to auction and use that as a proxy because, again, given the length of time it takes to foreclose in Cook County, we thought that was reasonable. came up with about 15%. And we haven't really been able to tell what impact this has had on tracking through the rest of the docket by taking this many cases out of the mainstream. Uh, we have a few other things that we would like to see happen that we hope will happen. Uh, one is that the FHFA, with its new director, will voluntarily comply, since by court order it's exempt, but will comply with the vacant property ordinances and maintain. Um, we would like to see more notice to stakeholders. People have said, you know, they, they don't even know who to notify. Um, we want to see more vigorous local code enforcement efforts. Uh, Chicago has a 311 system to report code violations. Uh, again, I'm not sure how effective it is. And I understand under the foreclosure settlement that the monitor has the ability to enforce anti-blight provisions. And I appreciate that, you know, clearly the monitor has other issues to deal with. And maybe that's not the top priority, but we would like to see more vigorous enforcement. And on that, thank you. Still going to pop up. Hmm? Ah. So, uh, last and hopefully not least, I, I'm first going to, Jen, answer the one question that most of the people here have been asking themselves since we started, which is Was Jen's criteria for speakers older white guys with white hair? <laughs> and or was it that we are qualified to speak on the subject? I hope it's both. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, so um, I'm Craig Nickerson, and I um, work with the National Community Stabilization Trust. I think what we've done is talked a little bit about the local level and some of the broader studies um, at the state and local level. I'm going to bring it to the national level and talk specifically about this notion of the walkaway properties. Um, and, you know, the, I think most of you know what the trust does. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, especially since I have eight minutes to do it. Uh, but you know that our primary vehicle, our primary notion since 2008 has been to help facilitate the transfer of distressed assets from servicers, GSEs, FHA, down to the local level with a lot of the um, uh, services who are here and not here, Tyler and Wells Fargo, Aquin, and, and many others. Um, we're also in many other areas, too, financing, and we're providing a lot more subsidiary or special services to support the local engagement. You'll see at the top of this little triangle, picture the triangle as neighborhood stabilization as a whole, what you do uh, on the ground. Uh, and there's a number of different categories of activity that we uh, engage in to convey property. Uh, and it started with REO, started with uh, the First Look program, which many of you know. Uh, when when inventory first enters the REO inventory, we make it available on a first 
right of, uh, right of first refusal basis to the nonprofit entity. And if they pass on it, then it goes uh, into the open market. Uh, and then from there, we evolved into donations uh, and done a lot of that with uh, Wells Fargo, with, uh, with many other institutions. But the future is not there. I think you all know the REO inventory is shrinking. And so we're at a point in time where are we done? Is, should the trust be done? Should all of us be done because most of the stuff is now in the pre-foreclosure space? Well, the answer is obviously no. Um, short sales will continue. Uh, there will be, we buy notes at 40 cents on the dollar in order to help occupied properties. But one of the biggest, most pernicious parts of the problem, which you've been hearing about today, are these low value, distressed, um, walk away properties. Now, how do we define those? Um, well, let me go back here. Um, for our purpose, we're defining the walkaway property as, as not, uh, Darren, uh, this morning, actually before this started, I went over to Darren to make sure I was right in characterizing his de depiction. He used the term zombie loans, which we sort of use too. It's a very, it's a nice term. It's, even if you don't like Walking Dead as a movie, it's a really good term. Um, services don't like it so much. But, um, but Darren used it in the context of vacant in pre-foreclosure. I'm talking now about something more definitive. It is that low value, distressed, condition property, Occ same as Spencer, occupied or vacant, where you're between a rock and a hard place. The servicer is in a conundrum. It doesn't make economic sense to push it through to foreclosure, right, because of the condition of the property, because of uh, maybe it's a, a slow judicial foreclosure state process, uh, because of uh, issues around, uh, fears around what will happen once they do own it and what they'll have to do with the property, uh, lien status, many other issues. But at the same time, they may not want to just walk away from it, charge it off and walk away. Uh, some of us would argue that's not a responsible activity either. So what we've come up with uh, is a, a, an alternative that is um, less expensive than pushing a property through to foreclosure and um, responsible in terms of getting the properties in the hands of an intermediary, in this case us again, and then conveying those to at the local, working at the local level with land banks, with nonprofits, with local governments, in order to facilitate the best resolution for each of those assets. So, as you see from the slide here, um, the notion is to deal with these, what we're calling loans in limbo, trying to move them along the process, have them contribute to neighborhood stabilization. What we hear all the time is, hey, you know, it's great that I got 123 Elm Street and 142 Elm Street and 121 Elm Street, but right in the middle of two properties, and I can't get my hands on them, who owns them? And we will find out they've been sitting there, probably vacant, for three, four, five years. How do we get our hands on those? That is really the future, I think, for our, our, our mutual efforts, is to try to wrest control of those assets and put them into the solution box from this purgatory that they're presently in, this intractable limbo state. I'm gonna skip ahead quickly here. Um, so our primary objectives here, as I pretty much explained, is to help move those things along the process. And we created an entity called the Community Restoration Corporation, CRC. Why do we do that? Well, when I went to our board and said, we have a great idea. Um, how about if the trust takes all these toxic assets that have less than 25,000 value, have a lot of property um, the properties are dilapidated. Um, we won't own the real estate, we'll just hold the note, and then we'll have to find the owner if they're not living in it, and then we'll resolve it. Does that sound like a good idea to you? And you can only imagine what they said back to me. Um, uh, something like, isn't retirement around the corner for you? Um, so th we created this entity, CRC, which is designed to hold the real estate. It is a vehicle, a, it's a nonprofit vehicle we created with the Housing Partnership Network that will hold that real estate, or hold the, those notes, rather, um, so we can help work with the local community to help remediate the situation. Um, the servicer will donate these assets, so we're not paying money for a, a, an asset that has no net, net present value. Um, we will have that note donated to us. We will then receive a financial contribution or donation from that institution, that servicer, to go along with the donations. Why would they do that? Because that donation of the note with a contribution will be far less expensive than that property going through the, 
sausage making of foreclosure and that foreclosure sale being in the hands of that servicer and having them with that sort of jeopardy of what to do with it next. And believe it or not, services are talking to us about this. We're talking to FHFA, the regulator for the GSEs, and the GSEs about it. We're talking to FHA. Um, we're talking to a number of the servicers, including some that are in the room. Um, and um, we fully expect this to grow as an activity. This, for us, we think is a major new frontier for 2014. And it's begun. We just started. So last week, uh, we signed an agreement with Bank of America. It's just a few hundred notes to begin with. There's many more um, where these come from. These happen to be portfolio loans, so they're easier to start with for, for Bank of America. Uh, but the, the plan here is to, um, you know, we've already been donated those notes. We're going to onboard them with our special servicer. We're going to do all the due diligence required by CFPB. But we're also going to do on-the-ground handholding if the property is occupied. Our first waterfall ob objective is to keep them in the home. We can do a principal reduction uh, that is of significant consequence here. We got the note for nothing. We can structure a monthly payment based on what they truly can afford uh, and give them a window of equity that they haven't seen perhaps in years. If they're not willing to stay, they've just given up on the property, they want to move on, maybe they have moved on, uh, we'll look to do a short sale or a deed in lieu, uh, if that's possible, and provide some relocation assistance where necessary to the homeowners. Uh, but we'll importantly be able with that Dean Lou to get control of the real estate and then help facilitate development of the property or in worst case scenario go to Gus uh, and say um, here's a, a property for your inventory and here's a check along with the property of some consequence more than 3500 even um, that will help with the remediation. So we think this may have some legs here um, and this initial effort with just the um, with, with Bank of America is just the beginning. Uh, just a, a few other points here. I think I went through this trying to right size payments. Um, you know, I, I personally think there was nothing ever wrong with a principal reduction as a solution. We see some, I was talking to one of the services the other day, they said, what we're going to do, and this is not principal reduction, is we're going to extend the term another 10 years, we're going to reduce the interest rate down to 1%, we're going to forbear some of the payment. And I said, well, why don't you just call it a principal reduction? No, no, not, we can't call it that. We can. Uh, we can structure that the right size of the payment. But in many cases, as some of you have already uh, indicated in your questions, people have given up. They've given up on that neighborhood, on that property. They're tired. They're beaten up. They want to move on. And we need to respect that and help them relocate, but at the same time, help find a solution for the property as well. And hence, working with community developers at the local level, nonprofits, maybe even for profits if they're working. Um, um, on a script that's created by the locality or by the nonprofit itself and help try to remediate those assets. And in the worst case scenario, we will foreclose, we will get control of the property, and we'll determine what the, what the, uh, what the opportunities or options are for that property and at that point in time. Um, I'm just going to go through all this really quickly. Uh, I think you've got the gist of what we were thinking about here. The key is the CRC is an entity that um, you won't be hearing a lot about. It's an entity that will hold the, the notes. Uh, the National Community Stabilization Trust and the Housing Partnership Network, which has members in Ohio and many other states, uh, will be operating the program. Uh, we are uh, the, the, the fee-for-service folks that are going to carry out the initiative. And we hope, if we do this again next year at this time, that we'll be at a point where we can talk about some of the lessons learned, the, the, the services that are participating, uh, some of the hopeful outcomes that we've had. And if nothing else, at least what we think we've been able to do is to move these particular notes out of their intractable current purgatory, their limbo state, their zombie state, whatever semantics we want to use, to move them into a resolution, uh, resolution mode get them at least to the point where we can figure out what does make sense for the property and the people. Hello? Oh, goodness, it is on. Thank you. So 
like I said, we're going to start with a couple questions to the panel, and then we will open it up to questions from you guys, and and we'll be monitoring the questions from out there in the universe. So Craig went last, so I'm going to ask him the first question. And please, for anyone on the panel, go ahead and feel free to jump in as well when the person is done speaking. Um, so. Craig, what you're talking about is more than a simple lean release. So I'm curious why that isn't a good option. Say that again, again. What you're talking about with this new program of yours is significantly more than a lean release. So can you talk about why that isn't an acceptable option? Mike. So, so um, we don't really think that a lean release per se, charging off on the books and doing a lean re release to the borrower uh, it sounds good, but it's not a solution. I think one of the questions earlier today uh, kind of highlighted this. It's, it's really, I think, for the servicer an abdication of responsibility. It's, it's a walking away. Um, this is a borrower that has troubles, struggles. They, they've, they've maybe lost interest in the property. They may have financial uh, or other issues that they're dealing with. The property has deteriorated. Um, and to just walk away uh, from that connection and finding some final resolution for the property we think is not good. But there's another reason too, Jen, um, and that's moral hazard. As I mentioned a minute ago, I don't believe the principal reduction really creates a, a significant moral hazard, but if, if I'm a borrower and I waited for four years without paying the servicer, and then I get the letter saying, okay, you win, um, what am I gonna talk about the next cookout to all my neighbors? I'm gonna say, guys, just wait them out you won't ever have to pay anything and you'll own the home free and clear. It's not a good outcome. And there's even more. Um, there's probably very seriously delinquent taxes on the property. The property's probably deteriorated over time. What we, what we need to find is a definitive solution, not a placebo. And I would suggest to you that uh, the charge of lien release, while economically viable for the servicer, um, is not necessarily the best outcome. Uh, whether the property is vacant or occupied. I give, I give Wells a lot of credit for what you're doing, Tyler, with the vacant properties and moving them through to foreclosure. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's a real answer. Okay. Uh, Craig and I have talked about this. Uh, in fact, we did over dinner last night. Um, and I think that the difference is that when I presented my hypothetical on my last slide, the uh, moral hazard hypothetical, and when Craig presents his hypothetical, we've got two different hypotheticals. And probably neither one of us is, we're just both speculating. The real answer is we need to find out what's happening with that particular property. Are they paying the taxes? Are they keeping the home up? Or are they really in severe trouble and they've stopped paying the taxes, they've stopped keeping the home up? Uh, I think there's a difference. And we can, you know, I would say Craig's right based on his hypothetical. I'd like to think I'm right based on mine. The real answer is I think we need to get down to the property by property at this point and figure out what's best for the neighbors on that street. Is it better to go ahead and empty out the home because that owner really is irresponsible? Or are they in fact, uh, you drive by and you say, boy, that home doesn't look any different except they're not making a mortgage payment. Um, I don't know about the cookout. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but I, I, I do think I've talked to I mean, I, I don't just do research in the ivory tower. I've looked at hundreds of vacant properties uh, over the years, and I get out of my car, I walk around, and I talk to neighbors. And most of the time, I get the impression the neighbors would have preferred that home stay occupied. They don't want to live next door to a vacant home with the windows open and the back doors open, their kids could get in there. They would prefer to see it occupied. And I'm not sure they're going to care the fact that that person is not paying a mortgage. They'd much prefer to have an occupied at home. But then my flavor of hypothetical, it's got to be tested. So I, I, you know, I think we need to look at each property. And, and Frank, we, we agree that the ideal is to maintain occupancy. I'm just curious. I don't know if you're at liberty to talk about it, Craig, but the 200-some properties or so that you're starting with, presumably, of course, it will, will scale up. But with those properties or any of them with the communities in this room, um, I don't know if you're at liberty uh, to say. I, I actually don't remember the exact list, but yes, absolutely. There's a lot of these that are in northern Ohio, actually throughout Ohio. I, I saw uh, properties in the Cincinnati and Columbus areas as well, Dayton. Uh, but interesting, they're all over. And we've, of course, looked at tapes from servicers, um, thousands and thousands of, of tapes, uh, not of tapes, but thousands and thousands of, of, uh, of, of properties on individual tapes with servicers. And 
Um, as you would expect, the vast majority of these notes and properties are in the Midwest and Southeast. Uh, there is a smattering throughout the entire country, but you know, most of the services define a, um, a low value charge off property as one that has a value of less than $25,000. Um, that sort of precludes California or uh, many other West Coast states. It actually precludes a lot of New York and New Jersey uh, where there's a lot of foreclosures and as people indicated earlier, a, an incredibly long judicial foreclosure process, but the land itself has a lot of intrinsic value. So we see this as very much a Midwest Southeast um, um, phenomenon. I'm interested in something Spencer pointed out that um, that once it's in the foreclosure process, it didn't necessarily matter as much the income level of the zip codes, that they were more or less equal. However, in reality, the end result is that because there are more foreclosures in lower income neighborhoods, they do disproportionately have more of the zombie properties. So I'm curious, from your perspective and, and the other folks on the panel here, what that really means related to policy. If it's not the zombies becoming more of them through the foreclosure process becoming the zombies, but there are just more foreclosures. I'm just wondering what that means for the rest of your work. That, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I was a little surprised that it, the percentages came out as nearly equal as they did. Um, in part, it may be that people in more affluent neighborhoods, it drags out in the process because they have more resources, they're negotiating, where a higher percentage of the lower properties in lower value census tracts were sold at auction. So they did go through when they went through, but then there were fewer alternative dispositions, fewer short sales. So that kind of offset the fact that in higher value census or higher income census tracts that fewer properties were auctioned, but there were more short sales, more deeds in lieu. And so the outcome finally of those that were unresolved that just kind of sat there came out about the same. And we'll have to look at, at go in more detail about why that's happening. I mean, I can speculate, but I really didn't look at the dockets carefully enough to see, you know, were the properties in higher value numbers more active overall, for example. Has anyone else on the panel looked at that issue at all? Just, it's not so much directly in response to that, but Spencer reminded me of this, that um, we, let's not forget that more than half of all foreclosures or, or initiated foreclosures are just in 10% of the census tracts in America. Uh, this isn't an equally distributed um, pain. Uh, and so, you know, we, um, we, we find ourselves sometimes in the dilemma that we limit uh, conveyance of donations or even first look to the hardest hit markets. Well, the HUD risk scores, if you're familiar with the HUD risk scores, um, aren't a perfect proxy for that. You know, we, we're in some, there's, a, there's a, a zip code in Detroit that covers part of Gross Point and part of North, um, North Detroit. Fundamentally different communities. And there's one risk score, it happens to be 14 or 15, which means it's a pretty hard hit market. Uh, designated for that that area. Well, I can assure you, not everything in that zip code is 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 comparable. So there's a lot of uh, responsibility for all of us, uh, whether we're, uh, on the ground or um, in a position like we are, to make sure that we're we're conveying the properties that really need to be conveyed and not interfering with the real estate market itself. This is actually going to be the last question for the panel. So if people do have questions, if they want to start thinking about it and lining up. Um, so this goes to Frank and Gus sort of together. Um, Frank, you mentioned something in your PowerPoint about the Youngstown uh, work with the bond and it being a process where when they were developing it, they really worked with the lenders to have a, an, an educational process as well as community members. Um, and Deb may even be able to speak to whether this works or not. Um, but I am interested in, in that relationship with the lending institutions about the educational piece and how you really create something that I imagine is still pretty controversial, but um, how you create something that does have an educational component so that they're a little more comfortable with it. What it makes me think about really is the 
we all know in, in all of our communities there are times when um, you have different relationships with the lender. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative, sometimes it's somewhere in between. So I'm curious how you maintain these partnerships over the long haul in a way that is productive for everybody. You want me to go first? Okay. Uh, I think it was very smart for Youngstown to say we're not going to act on this ordinance immediately. Let's spend several months talking to lenders. Let's spend months talking to people in the community. Um, and I, I think that's the right approach. I don't think the Youngstown folks are assuming that, well, it's all going to be rosy because we did that. As it turns out, they're getting compliance. But I think they probably know that as what happened in Springfield, Massachusetts, five banks uh, took them to court. It's in court in Massachusetts right now, and the federal U.S. Uh, actually was in the district court, and uh, the ordinance was upheld, and the banks appealed to the Court of Appeals, and that's on hold. I think it's only a matter of time before there's going to be a court case against Youngstown, if I were to guess. And I, so I think that it, it's... Even though they did the right thing and they tried to build the relationships, this is, they're going to be financial institutions that are going to say, we don't want to pay that 10000 uh, So I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm saying it's the right thing to do to build the relationships, but I think it's also the right thing to do to take a hard stand and say, you're making us absorb costs we can't absorb. So I, I'm not sure I'm answering your question fully. Um, I probably didn't. But maybe Gus will be kinder and gentler, I'm sure, right? No, I, I, uh, I fully agree with what you said. I mean, you have to have a dialogue if you want to get anywhere. But in this, um, in this space, um, the carrot and the stick has to be in play. I mean, I just don't think you can be all about dialogue and let's, let's have a, um, you know, kumbaya all the time. It's got to be dialogue, but with a consequence. And so... Um, so I think that the carrot and the stick and the cord, if necessary, um, all that needs to be in play. People have to come to the table. Can I add one more thing? I was thinking about something that uh, Mark Wiseman said. My Mark Wiseman is my hero today. I thought, uh, where are you, Mark? I thought you had, that was great. Um, we get applause because you're, my supposed hero to, too. You're, supposed to, <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to applaud us after we do our thing. He got applause and he's standing out there in the audience. Um, what Mark's point was, it's something, there needs to be a change in thinking at the front end of this process. And I did hear, I heard some things that suggested that, that I think it might have been Tyler, that, that somebody, one of the lenders, did say something that suggested there is a new possible thinking about how we approach this at the front end. But I don't think it's what the f lending industry is doing mainstream. So why does Youngstown say you've got to post a bond? Because there isn't mainstream thinking that at the front end we should be doing different doing something different. So they're saying, until you start thinking differently on the front end, we're going to say, at the front end, you got to post a $10,000 bond. Um, I think, if nothing else, it gets people to stop and think, do we, wait a minute, we've got to post a $10,000 bond. Oh, should we approach this foreclosure differently instead of that? I'd like to think that that may happen. Looks like we have a couple questions. All right. Uh, thank you, Tom Fitzpatrick, Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And what I, I really appreciate what you guys do, especially at the local level. It's really hard crafting local responses to what can often feel like a national machine that, that, that you're, you're trying to intervene with. And, and what I hear is a lot of incentives, right? We want to sort of lower the cost of good behavior and increase the cost of bad behavior. Uh, so, so I guess my question is, how do we know when we're successful and how do we know when we've failed? How do we measure outcomes? And in your experience with the, whether it's various ordinances, uh, or, you know, creating land banks as responsible repositories. How do you measure success and failure? Oh. <laughs> okay, I'll go for it. We come to you, Tom. Yeah, to right. Help us evaluate we ask you to it. do some research to see if you can figure it out. Um, well, you know, for me, there, uh, this may not be what you're looking for, but there's some very basic indicators that I think at the end of the day are what we look at. It's the front end incoming pipeline of new foreclosure. It's tracking how many homes go uh, into abandonment. It's tracking home sale prices. And eventually success to me is more homes are occupied. Uh, property values become stabilized. People want to stay in the neighborhood because there are a few abandoned homes. Uh, 
That may not be what you were looking for, but I, I think that I'm looking at those bigger end goals to sort of track when are we successful or not. Um, no, I'll let you. Tom, you know, I mean, not so much like on an econometric um, level, because that's sometimes difficult to do, but um, piggybacking on to what Frank said, you know, um, we have um, Mike Schramm in our office, you know, who, who does, I mean, data has a lot to do with it. You know, Neo can do um, that, that tool plus all of the stuff that we've added on to it. Um, at the front end, oftentimes we're able to, to focus foreclosures, for example. We're able to target areas and focus areas based on the pulse of that market, being able to really put properties to what Frank just said. Um, we are often able to determine through that scrub um, what neighborhoods are tipping, which ones are not, which ones um, have catalytic activity going on there. And so those things are given, those are given indicators of progress. And so if you can match the property, match the intervention, match the quality result, whether it's a good disposition and a rehab versus, uh, or demolition versus doing the same thing in a place that has absolutely no, no front end qualitative indicators of impact, uh, then that's harder. But I think what we do, and data is so important, data research, data accumulation, and filtering um, helps us. I'd also like to add that it's not just foreclosures that are the problem in Chicago. There are neighborhoods that have seen disinvestment for 50 years and have high vacancy rates. Not all of them are attributable to foreclosures. So any solution that we come up with locally that only addresses properties that are going into foreclosure, that are in the process, that are REO, is only going to be a partial solution. And the metrics that we use to look at the neighborhoods are going to have to be much broader than just dealing with the foreclosure, foreclosure process. Just uh, one last word on this. Um, first of all, I know what it's not. Um, we, it's not that federal money expires and therefore we're done. We, we, I swear across the country, how, I can't tell you how many different community nonprofits have said to us, um, we're not going to take any more donations or first look properties because we don't have the neighborhood stabilization program money. Well, but the neighborhood still has needs. I, I worry a great deal about left behind neighborhoods. I, we, were talk, we used to use the term neighborhood stabilization. There's clearly a neighborhood stabilization fatigue in the marketplace. Um, this is a marathon, it's not a 100 yard dash, be really corny. Um, and I, I, actually I've been accused of having another cornball uh, uh, metaphor, which is we're barely at halftime. And at halftime, what do you do? You, you refine your game plan, you make it more complex, you make it more responsive to what you're seeing on the field. And I'm really worried in a lot of markets that, that we're sort of stopping at halftime. Uh, we need to be resourceful and come up with the next new things that can complement the things that have worked today. Yeah, and just really quickly, this isn't answering the question, but um, jumping on what uh, Spencer noted about, it's not just the foreclosed properties. And so to the extent that, and he mentioned it in his presentation, I think it was his presentation, you know, where is code enforcement in this process? Where are these other systems in the process? It's really critically important. And uh, Gus mentioned just very briefly the fast track foreclosure process. You know, thinking about how all of these other systems are relating to the problem of vacancy, the larger problem of vacancy, only part of which is compounded by foreclosures, is really critically important. Go to the left. Hi. Um, my name is Michael Hanley. I'm an attorney with the uh, public interest law firm in, in Rochester, New York, called the Empire Justice Center. Um, and we, we finished a, a data analysis of the Rochester's five years of foreclosures, and we were looking at the property records to see what types of properties were really causing the vacancy problems. And first of all, let me say your panel has really given me a lot of ideas. We're, we are trying to fashion some local laws and recommendations for state strategy. But one of the things that strikes me that we discovered that was somewhat of a surprise was the difference between the owner-occupant properties and the investor properties in foreclosure. And I know that's hard to track, but I'm wondering how the tools and levers that you've described you think would apply differently. We have about 20% uh, of our foreclosures are, are vacant properties, and about 25% uh, yeah, 20 are vacant. Uh, and that's about 25% of all the vacant properties. So, so first of all, you know, you make that cut to which vacants are from foreclosure, but then the question was which of those foreclosures were investor properties. And the, the vacants 
in foreclosure, 75% of them were investor properties. So I'm wondering if you think the tools and levers need to be tweaked differently or could be applied differently on both the code enforcement side and on the disposition strategies. Do you have an opinion about the programmatic approaches you would use for an investor owned versus yeah. homeowner owned? Um, we do. I mean, obviously, what we're trying to, part of our waterfall, once we get control of the notes, our top of the waterfall is um, helping owner occupants stay in their home. That's, that's the most cost effective and the most appropriate, even if we need to also provide some funding to help renovate uh, the property in the process. Uh, with investors, let me, uh, t one step back. Um, from your question, in the tapes that we re reviewed, and these are now tens of thousands of, of actual property records, about 60%, 60 percent, 65 percent of the, um, the properties are vacant. So these are the below 25,000 value charge off candidate properties. About two thirds of them are vacant, the other one third is occupied. Among the vacants, a very high proportion, but I can't take, give you an actual number, are in, in fact investors. They tend to be not the, the new uh, private equity Wall Street backed guys. These are the mom and pops who bought you know, a home because it was going to be their retirement uh, uh, resource and it just didn't work out for them. Um, and they, they literally walked away a long time ago. Uh, those are gonna be tough uh, because even tracking them down with, we're using not just skip tracing, but private investigators and community engagement and other things to try to find the borrowers. But um, in, in that instance, we, we fully expect that in most cases we're going to be dealing with a foreclosure because a deed in lieu will not be uh, possible. I would ju just add really quickly, and then I will note that we have it's like two, three minutes left before we need to break for lunch. Um, with the, because you mentioned you're from Rochester, New York, one of the states that somewhat recently passed land bank legislation has, I think, five or ten up running right now or that are starting um, you know different land banks look at occupied properties whether they accept them whether they won't accept them very differently and so as they're starting out thinking about what their programmatic goals are whether they're going to accept properties that have occupants in them if they do what that means for the programming are they going to manage them are they going to try to negotiate some sort of um, deal with them and something it's just something that all land banks will confront and one last question. There was someone ahead of me. <clears throat> oh. Thanks. Oh. The, sorry, Tom. Uh, the, we, uh, we have more than 240 people who have signed on to participate in this program. So thanks very much for accommodating uh, the questions. There are two, actually, that uh, I'm going to relay. They overlap. So I'll, uh, it's from Matt Rossman, who's a professor at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, as well as Greg Hagopian from the city of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, two quick ones. Do lenders who donate notes to community reinvestment corporations get an income tax deduction? And then also, where should a nonprofit, CDC, start in approaching banks or servicers about donation of a stalled property held by a bank or servicer? So several of you have addressed the moral hazard and the challenges, but if you have, if you have any advice for CDCs, what would it be? Well, on, on the, the last part, um, if it's a donation in REO, it's easy. It's real estate, and uh, they can reach out to the servicer directly. Um, if it's, um, you know, Wells Fargo, Bank America, and um, Freddie Mac and a few others, they can reach out to us, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do to make that property available. We vet donation recipients in much the same way we do a first look. It's a different set of criteria. It's more flexible. Uh, but we still want to make sure who, who, whoever is receiving that donated property has some uh, uh, plan for uh, remediation. Um, if it's in this space that we're talking about here of um, trying to get control of the note and then remediate the, uh, the note and the property for the people, um, you know, I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to get donated notes. Uh, there's a lot of risk involved. There's a lot of... Um, uncertainty and so uh, I think we've got to develop more of a, a systematic predictable transparent process for c conveying property than a lot of one-off stu one stuff. Frankly the, the fact that we're starting with you know a few hundred with Bank America is, um, um, is because we want to test the waters and make sure we get it streamlined and right before we get to the bigger numbers. Uh, this is daunting stuff with high risk uh, but it is absolutely the next step in the process. 
Any last final? Just on the question of how would CDCs go about getting donations, I think it's been covered. Craig had a great suggestion for how they get in touch with the servicer. But I've got another issue. It's that I think they better make very sure that they want that property, even as a donation. They should, uh, and in the study that I referenced at the beginning of my talk, uh, the REO investor study, we have a whole section that's almost a tool for how to do that analysis, and I would suggest if we can get that out to people, because I, I think it's really important that CDCs don't overreach, or anybody overreach, and say, oh, it's donated. This has got to be a great deal. Now, maybe not. The cost may still not work for the market sale prices in that neighborhood. And, and the, the devil's in the details. There, there is... Uh, a lot of the properties that we see that are donated have value. There is, I totally agree with Frank, but they do have value. So you've got to do the due diligence, do the analysis, determine how much of a built-in subsidy do I get if I'm taking this donated piece of REO, this property. Uh, and in some cases, you know, it can be ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. You heard Tyler mention they're renovating the properties as, through, the, through the foreclosure process, even if they end up donating it. So some of these properties do have value, but this is not for the weak of heart. It's tough stuff. And you don't want to end up being the entity in your community that now is holding the distressed real estate without a, a, uh, a plan. Ending on the note that you need fortitude to enter into this process, um, we are, I think, ready to break for lunch. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, let's thank the panel. <laughs>